John chapter 1 verse 10. I have a little message I preach sometimes and to God be all the glory. The greatest trip, the greatest tragedy, and the greatest transaction. John 1.10 said he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. But he came unto his own and his own received him not. The greatest trip. He came, came down from heaven. And the greatest tragedy, his own received him not. But I like the greatest transaction, but as many. You can put your name there if you're saved. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of man, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Amen. Well, He's come to us and His grace has brought this salvation to our heart. Well, we're going back tonight. Appreciate your good song, Brother Lester. And Brad doing a good job presenting the music. Done a good job, don't you think? Ah, you tell him at the end, give him a hug for it. All right, Revelation chapter 8 again tonight in our studies. We're picking up with Revelation chapter 8 with our seven sevens in the Revelation series that we've been launching here along in the studies, sometimes in and out, and uh, trying to do it on Sunday evening. And the key to this study of the Revelation, I say the detailed outline makes the Revelation a unique book above any other books of the Bible. And the way to understand the Revelation, and I'm, I'm still... I'm still trying to get a hold of a lot of it. And the, the good way to get acquainted with it is to know something about the other 65 books of the canon of Scripture. But I shall read in Revelation 1.19 before I pray and bring this lesson. And here's a detailed outline to this Revelation epistle. Most other books don't have an outline this, this detailed. But John the Apostle, writing under inspiration of the Holy Ghost, and here he's commanded to write three things, past, present, and future. Write the things which thou hast seen, and that corresponds to Revelation 1. The things which are corresponding to Revelation 2 and Revelation 3, and the things which shall be hereafter corresponding with Revelation 4, 5, and all the way down to Revelation chapter 22. And there is a hereafter. And that makes it a prophetic book. Things that shall come to pass. And I acknowledge as I deepen into this Revelation study, I've not got it all together. I don't claim to be a scholar with, with anything even especially the revelation of Peter. But I am trying. I am trying to strive to get it all together. And I suppose it will never master. We'll never be able to master any portion of this Bible in its totality. But anyway, we're looking at some things that really get your eyes caught up. And get your heart to really think. And so we're going to study tonight with Revelation chapter number 8 and I do need to give us a little preview to kind of fit us right in where we are in the successive events that are taking place in the Revelation. Father we come on this evening Lord to thank you Lord that you've blessed us. Lord you've laid upon us this great blessing Lord that a lot of folk don't have on this evening. Lord that we can come together Lord, as the church, Lord, as members of the one body of Christ, the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven, Lord, as a local New Testament church, and I pray you'll help us tonight. Lord, as we read your word, Lord, may the Holy Ghost of God, Lord, that born us again, take these things, and Lord, show them the truth. Show us the truth of Christ, and his word in prophetic view we pray. To you be all honor and glory we pray 
In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now we've mentioned, we've saw, and if you have the little outline that I have passed along, Revelation 1 is the sevenfold presented vision of the glorified Christ and setting forth Christ in a sevenfold vision. Oh, I tell you, we see Him in His glorified, in this setting of Revelation chapter 1. And we'll not take the time to give all that's, that's encompassed in Revelation 1. But Revelation 2 and Revelation 3, a sevenfold prescribed account of the seven churches. And we've studied that and taken in the, the two chapters, Revelation 2, Revelation 3. And then we studied Revelation 4 and Revelation 5. Revelation 4, the saints in heaven. We've been raptured out per se with Revelation 4, 1. Them few verses caught up. That's the next great event that we're looking for on this eve. We're waiting for that call to come. When the trumpet's going to sound, we'll hear the sound and see the Savior. Amen. But we're around the throne of God, worshiping Him because of creation. That's important. And then in Revelation 5, we're, we're around the throne, worshiping Him because of redemption. And all Revelation 5 is really set in the way for the verses that we're picking up with tonight. Because it introduced us to the one that's worthy to open the seven seal book and loose the seals of the the seals uh, having to do with him being the redeemer of mankind. And, uh, and I'll tell you, he paid the price on the cross not only to redeem the church and to redeem, make us fully saved at the rapture or the resurrection morning, redeem body, but to redeem Israel and redeem the earth. Amen. The title deed to this earth is in Revelation chapter 5. That entitles him that one day he shall reign supreme here on this earth. And of course, in Revelation chapter 5, it unfolds. And we're seeing the worth and the work and the worship of the Lamb. And then our lessons proceeded on to Revelation chapter 6. The seven seal judgment. The first seal, the false Messiah, the Antichrist. The second seal, the false, the false peace. You see, peace is going to be short-lived after we're gone. And with the rise of the Antichrist, it will be just for a little while a false peace. And then the third seal of famine, the fourth seal of the fate of death, the fifth seal of the faithful remnant, and the sixth seal, the forces of nature bringing down God's wrath upon this earth. And so that gets us now to Revelation chapter 7 where we dealt with, and we've dealt with this interlude period, this parenthetical passage. And I, I've been saying between the sixth seal and the seventh seal, he gives us a remnant of the Jews that the Lord's going to seal the 144,000 Jewish witnesses, witnesses of the Lamb, I must say, that will preach the gospel of the kingdom in the tribulation period, Matthew 24, 13 and 14. Not only did we see the remnant of the Jews with the 144,000 seal servants, but we saw the redeemed of the Gentiles. John saw a number that he could not number. A multitude of folk that were saved. And uh, they had, uh, and they had uh, washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And John said these that have come out of great tribulation. So redeemed of the Gentiles. A period of salvation in that tribulation period. And so now we're getting with my text. 
we're reading tonight with this seventh seal, this seventh seal judgment that has followed the sixth seal. And we have really saw the tribulation getting on the first three and a half years of tribulation in Revelation chapter 6 under the sixth seal. When God's going to turn the moon into blood, black out the sun as black as set claws of hair, let the stars fall out of their place and fall to the earth and the islands move out of their place for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand. And I was reading this evening and I didn't get that in my notes in our past study, but I'm really, really favored to believe that God's going to allow something like an atomic bomb to take place in the last portion of Revelation chapter 6. And I've read just a little bit on the history of the atomic bomb that went off and, and all the devastation. They said even those that dropped the bomb, it almost shook them out of their existence and blackened the, the sun and, and between earth and the sun and the moon even couldn't shine because of the darkness of that atomic bomb. But I'm favored that will be much of what's going to take place when this old world is going to reel and rock. And all oh, the Lord's going to shake the sinners out of it. But here and we're seeing the seventh seal introducing now this new set of judgments that we've been mentioning. I see, I see in my notes that we see the seven who proclaim judgment. And we've already dealt with the seven seal judgment. And now we're picking up with our lesson on the seven trumpet judgments. Judgments and they get worse and worse as we go on down the way. And all oh, the wrath, the symbols of God's wrath, God in His wrath. Somebody said Jesus is too gentle to be that be that hard upon wicked men. But I've read the book and I I'm just taking God at His word. All oh, the wrath of Almighty God that we're seeing begin to unfold for the tribulation that's out of here. But I shall read now, and then we'll just, I'll be brief as I can tonight. But at John writing, in verse 1 of Revelation chapter 8, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. And really, it's really hard, hard to really Take on what's going on here. You think about all the praise and the glory and the worship that's going on in heaven, even on this eve, with those that have outstripped us and went on to glory, and they're not in a bump of spirit. No, I tell you, they're in a reality. They know where they're at. And they're in a place of comfort, in a place of rejoicing. Oh, I tell you, Luke, wrote it down and said there's joy, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repenteth. Amen. There's rejoicing when people down here get saved. There, there's some kind of connection and I don't know what's in all embodied it, but there's some joy and rejoicing and praising God around the throne of God even on this evening. But I read the account of Revelation 5, and we're going to, we've been seeing that the church is around the throne of God, praising the Lamb that has redeemed us by His blood ever kindred, out of every kindred, nation, tongue, and people. But just think about it. For the space of 30 minutes, there's going to be silence in heaven. And here, I think it's got a lot to weigh on the seven seal book. The Lord, He's the only one that was was entitled and worthy to open the seven seal book and the loose of seals are all. And now He's getting down to the end of that seven seal book which entitles Him to, to, to a title deed to the earth. And all I tell you, with that, to unloose the wrath of God in all of its intensity. 
And I said here last Sunday evening, if memory corrects me, when we start with a seven trumpet judgment, we'll see the wrath of God and His full intensity, intensity on a rebellious, Christ-rejecting, grace-despising, God-hating generation that settled down in the world and will be here for tribulation on this earth. And so there's a space of time, 30 minutes of silence in heaven. I call it a holy hush. I call it when heaven pauses for a few minutes and all getting the world ready for what is coming on. And John said in verse 2, not only have we seen the seventh seal, which is introducing these seven trumpet judgments, and we've seen the silence in heaven, but here's the seven trumpets now getting ready to unfold. And John said, I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And oh, when God's dealing with Israel, you'll see signs and symbols and you'll see, you'll see angels. God used angels. And here are these, uh, these that God has selected for Himself to give Him praise. And these that will be, be in, incorporated in the working of bringing each one of these prescribed judgments to pass. But here John saw the seven angels. And they stood before God and they were given seven Trumpets, getting ready to, to sound the seven trumpets of judgment. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And I don't know what, what some people have the idea this throne is about. But I'm, I'm favorites beyond the throne of God in heaven. I'm thinking it's getting us on down the way to the millennial age and the millennial throne that will be enthroned with the Lord Jesus. But anyway, he talks about this angel that stands at the altar and having a golden censer. And if you know how the temple and the tabernacle was laid out, you go in to the tabernacle proper and the first article of furniture you'd see was that, that brazen altar where the sacrifices were made. And beyond that, going toward the holy place was the laver, all the laver where the priest would wash. And then on to the, the first compartment would be the holy place. And in that holy place would be the altar of incense and the table of showbread and the candlestick. And of course the candlestick lit the holy place. And the showbread had to do with the fellowship, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense where the prayers of the saints were sent up. And so you get a little picture. And on all beyond the veil was the holy of holies where the mercy seat and where the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat in between the cherubims and where the Lord said, I'll meet with Israel. God's meeting place. But here we're seeing a picture now. And here's this angel and he's standing at the altar and he's got a golden censer. And he said, and there was given him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And I'm reading right what's on my heart in this verse on this evening. I'm favored to believe that God is remembering His people right here. Amen. All the prayers that have been prayed, and I've said in this pulpit, God don't forget. God is a God that remembers. You can count on that. And every prayer that you prayed in the will of God and in the Spirit of God, every prayer that you prayed and have not seen answered, God heard that. God's got it wrote down. And I believe God's going to make it right one of these days as sure as I'm in this place. I believe He's not only bottled up our tears that we shed, but I believe He's 
bottled up our prayers. Amen. That's scriptural. And so, here's many, I'm telling you, that'll be in that tribulation period. And they've been taught. And they've been, it been prophesied. And our Lord stood in His, in His sermon on the mount. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 18, this model prayer that He taught His disciples to pray. And He said, Pray, thou, thy Father which in heaven... Thy, and I, I need to thumb back there and get it started right. Don't have it just right, but we will take the time and look at this verse because it's fitting for my, my message for this verse I'm dealing with about the prayers of the saints. But look at it. Matthew chapter 6. He taught them in this new revelation concerning prayer. Be not ye therefore like unto them. He's talking about the hypocrites and and the, the Pharisees with their uh, religious, uh, uh, the religion and their rituals and their ripple, repetitional prayer. He said, don't you be like that crowd. He said, for your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. He wants us to ask, but he knows beforehand what we need. He's reading the heart. He knows us without and within. I'm to, he knows our thoughts of, of far off. He made it. He knows our frame on this evening. But notice he said, after this manner, pray, pray ye our Father which are in heaven. How be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And all oh, that's the key. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if I know my Bible and to God be all the glory, that's what's going to take place down in the golden age of the millennium. Heaven's reigning over the earth in the golden millennial age. The kingdom of heaven that will be set up right here on this earth. And all oh, I'm telling you, the Lord's going to answer that prayer. Oh, He taught them to pray, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And God's going to answer that prayer. He's moving minutely and with succession with all of His wrath that He can muster up against a Christ-rejecting, God-hating, grace-despising generation that's set, down, set on going right straight toward heaven. He, he's going to bring every minute detail for his second coming back to this earth again when he will make all things right. Amen. But I'm telling you, these prayers of the saints, they said they ascended up before God out of the angel's hand in verse 4, but that ain't all of it. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. And I'm saying again, God remembers His people. Amen. Oh, He remembers those that have suffered. Those that will be martyred in the awful time of the tribulation. Oh, if we back our lesson up tonight to Revelation chapter 6 and verse 9 under the fifth seal we talked about the martyr remnant and God has always had a remnant amen we talked about that remnant of the Jews that will be sealed to preach the gospel during the tribulation but here's a remnant oh he writes about in Revelation 6 verse 9 and John said when he had opened the fifth seal I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And it said they cried and they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And it said white robes were given unto them and of every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And oh, God's going to 
He's going to make it up for those that have been martyred. Yes, He will. He's going to hear the prayers of the saints. But this prayers of the saints is going to reach in to God's vengeance. Oh, this angel took the censer in verse 5 of Revelation 8 and he filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Oh, God's vengeance. God's wrath, I'm telling you, being unloosed in all of its intensity more than even with what happened in Revelation chapter 6. But here we're seeing now in verse 7 he's getting in more detail about these trumpet judgments and we're going to deal with four of these before we close tonight. But look at it. Now the first trumpet judgment and the first angel sounded and there followed hell and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth and the third part of trees was burnt up and all green grass was burnt up. Oh, can you imagine? And I know it's hard for us. It's really hard for us to grasp all these things that are going to take place. You say, do you really believe it's literal? I really believe it. It's lit. And this Bible's literal unless God says it's symbolic. And He'll let us know it's symbolic. Just on down in this passage, if I have time to get it over tonight. But all oh, we take this Bible with face value. We take it in faith that what God said He meant and that settles it. I'm there. God said it and that settles it. And God means what He says and says what He means. And so with the first trumpet, there's going to be hell and fire mingled with blood and it's going to be cast upon the earth and the third part of trees will be burned up and all green grass burned up. All plant life. Oh, what a horrible time. If you could just picture it in your mind just a little bit. Me and my son, Kevin, we y'all used to hike with him a lot. And after the, the burn in all the mountains up yonder, near the the chimneys and he took me up there after sometime after that and we walked through the woods in portions of the, going to the chimneys and uh, you just would not believe the, the ground just black I mean black as coal and everything around just burnt to a crisp and all oh, in the tribulation when God calls for this angel to send hell and fire mingled with blood and all the plant life is going to be destroyed a third part of trees you think about all the beautiful forest and 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 the mountains all of, we're, we're in that this this place that the, in here in east tennessee the beautiful mountains but oh god's going to send the fire he's going to send the hell and and then the blood i'm telling you right here symbols of God's wrath. Then the second trumpet and the second angel sounded and as it were. As it were. You ought to circle that in your Bible. That means it's symbolic. That means you don't take it literally. As it were. A great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. Now I need to just get right here for this little message tonight and I won't be much longer. But a mountain in Scripture is a symbol of the kingdom. It sure as I'm in this place tonight. A mountain in Scripture is a symbol of the kingdom. Now we're going to look at some of these verses and we'll, we'll go on a little bit if I have time tonight. But look at Isaiah. We're going to thumb just a little bit. And that's the way we learn. And that's what we're here for. To get an understanding of the Word of God. And so you get a little here and a little there. Some more down the way. You'll say, well, I heard him say what a mountain represented in Scripture. But it's in Isaiah chapter number 2. And I believe it's in verse 2. And I'm doing some of this by memory tonight. And as the Lord lays it on my heart. 
But we'll be right there in just a moment. Isaiah chapter 2. Look at your Bible and the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days. That's prophecy that's going to be fulfilled. Last days revelant to his chosen elect coveted people Israel. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us His ways, and we will walk in His paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And you've heard me say just recently, God has chosen Jerusalem. He's chosen Mount Zion. And in an earthly Sitting, I'm telling you, he's chosen it for himself. That's why he's coming back where he's coming to. Thank God. And all oh, it's going to come to pass. The mount the, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains. Earthly Jerusalem is sure as we're in this place. And all oh, men Judas had the privilege five different times. To go around that city, the old city of Jerusalem, with all of its its repair and being built back up from where it was tore down, and and I tell you, oh, a blood, a field of blood around that city from ancient times, with all the all the the enemies that have come in and just made the destruction, even with Titus and in A.D. 70, the Roman prince that rode for, for through Jerusalem and left not one stone upon another that was not thrown down, Matthew 24. But oh, thank God, the great I Am, the Lord Jesus Christ, the great commander-in-chief will step off from glory one of these days. And thank God, put His feet back on the Mount of Olives where He left from in His ascension, Acts chapter 1, and thank God he'll go right in the eastern gate that's now blocked off with steel and, and barbed wire and block and, and whatever they could put in that. He's going to go right through that eastern gate. And thank God coming back to the place he's chosen for himself. But all this kingdom we're saying in Psalm 46 verse 2, and I won't give you all these verses, but I'm just trying to whet your appetite a little bit about this mountain in Scripture. Psalm 46 and verse 2, Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, Though the waters are out roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof shall lie, there is a river, the streams whereof shall be made glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early. The heathen raised and the kingdoms were moved and he uttered his voice and the earth melted. Amen. And so God symbolizes this word mountain and represents a kingdom. The sea represents the nations, the masses of people. The sun that we're going to read about before I close is a symbol of His highest authority. The moon speaks of derived authority. The stars is a symbol of His subordinate authority. And so here is a great mountain as it were. Not really a, a great mountain, but as a great mountain. Oh, and he says right here in my text, burning with fire and was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood, and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Oh, God's going to let it happen literally happen, bringing down his judgment and I tell you, casting a, as it might be, a mountain of fire all to the sea. And the third part of the creatures 
which were in the sea that had life died and the third part of ships were destroyed. Little by little, succession after succession of his events of wrath bringing down this world into judgment. For the judgment of God upon this earth. And then in verse 10, the third angel sounded. There fell a great star from heaven burning. Here it is again. Here's a, here's a symbol. As it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers. And upon the fountain of waters. The rivers. And the waters affected with his wrath. Not only the green grass. It was all burned up. And the third part of the trees. And the third part of the creatures of the sea are without life and die. But oh, I'm telling you, the third part of rivers and upon the fountain of water. And you're going to later see more than that. When God's going to turn the water, I'll tell you, they'll turn on the faucet and blood will come out. And oh, this gets worse. The horrible monstrosities God's going to turn loose on this earth that we'll read in the next lesson Lord willing, in Revelation chapter 9, but verse 11, and the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. And I'm, I'm convinced this verse connects us with some human being that God has selected. I don't know who it is, whether it be Satan or the Antichrist, but oh, he's going he's gonna to have that part. Oh, the, to turn the waters to bitter where men will be poisoned literally to death. And then the last one that I'm dealing with, the fourth trumpet judgment, and it's right here in verse 12 and 13. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened. And the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise, and John said, I beheld, and heard an angel flying through the mist of heaven, saying with a loud voice, You say, you say, an angel flying, and an angel uttering a voice? Yes, that's what this Bible says with a loud voice saying, Woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of other voices, the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. And I've seen three things in closing in this passage we've read tonight. I see the power of the sovereign and his supernatural work. And we don't, we just can't hardly get it all together. But I'm, I'm telling you, God is going to unloose his wrath. And he knows how to do it. He's in, he's in charge. And he's, he's always been in charge. When our Lord Jesus died on the cross, he was in full command at all times. I'm telling you. Though the awful death he suffered, he was in full command. He could call it all a halt if he wanted to. But I'm saying, here's a one. I tell you, there ain't nothing going to take him by surprise. The power of the sovereign and the supernatural. This book is a supernatural book. Beyond any book that we could ever get a hold of is this King James. But I say it's a physical miracle written by men and authored by God. And our Lord Jesus is a supernatural Christ. All oh, his birth was supernatural. His death was supernatural. His resurrection was supernatural. And His second coming is going to be supernatural. Here's the one that took a little boy's lunch and fed 5,000. Here's the one that they went to the temple and they was making merchandise in the house of God, selling. And God took a whip and whipped them. Well, they say He's too gentle. He whipped them out of the temple. Oh, yes, he did. And here he's going to rise in his, all of his judgments and wrath. And oh, John said, not only the power of the sovereign in his supernatural work, the prayers of the saints that God's going to recompense, but all the 
prescribed woes upon those that are settled down in the world. Oh, he said right here in my text in closing, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And that means those that are now settled down in the world and saying, I'll not be moved. Oh, they act like they're going to live forever. A lot of folk do, but they're going to have a rude surprise soon. The church is going to get an exit and the world's going to get a get a false messiah. The Antichrist and all hell is going to break loose on this earth. But I'm glad we know where we're going. We're going to be with Jesus. Father,